I better get started. So these notes come from Dr. Olafson, who many of you love and admire. I'm still at the VA over there, but um, I adapted them a little bit today. But this is going to be talking about lenses and prisms. Um, this was a trip we just took to Lake Powell over UEA a few weeks ago. And this is oh, the, uh, this is our screaming daughter who was happy like the entire time, except when we wanted a family picture. So. Um, <laughs> But it's an awesome trip. We found this cool little island here, did some hiking, some really sweet formations. Anyway, so start out talking about uh, stigmatism a little bit. Um, pretty basic, but um, in regular stigmatism, the axes are going to be 90 degrees apart as opposed to irregular stigmatism, like in keratoconus or ectasias, things like that. Um, so one thing to remember about um, regular stigmatism and it kind of, if you think of it as like a loose lens that you pick up out of the, the trial drawers, um, that's one of, you know, a five diopter um, plus sill. Um, the extreme values are 90 degrees apart. So along the axis, along where those two little arrows are, there's zero power along that axis. The power actually comes 90 degrees from that. So, um, and another thing that's interesting about those is um, and we did this in labs in optometry school. But if you do shine a light through it, it, as opposed to a spherical lens, which will make a point focus, these will end up making a line focus. Um, and so you'll actually see a straight line if you put a piece of paper behind the lens. So the power meridian is always 90 degrees from the axis. Um, and then here's just a little example down here from this prescription. So this is exactly like what you would pick up out of the loose lens set. So Plano plus, Plano plus 5, axis 45. Um, the plus 5 is actually at axis 135. The Plano is at 45. And have you guys done much with power crosses a little bit? So go over that a little bit. Um, there's a few practice problems throughout here. If you want to try them out, that'd be awesome. But um, let's see, we'll keep going. So just as we were just talking about with the plane cylinders, that means there's no sphere. Um, the power in the axis is zero, and the maximum power is 90 degrees from that. Um, yeah, we kind of talk about most of this stuff. Um, but there is no line focus image formed by the axis meridian, just the power meridian. So this just demonstrates why you get a line focus from a cylinder. If you think of a cylinder as actually being a cylinder that you just kind of chop a part of it off, um, then you can see that no matter where the planes of light are coming in, they all get focused to a single point. But because you have an infinite number of those points, it ends up creating a line. And on top, um, this is a plus cylinder. So you would end up. Um, with a focal line behind the lens. Now, would this be a real image or a not real image, yeah, virtual image? What's that? Real image. Real image? Yeah. So since it's to the right of the lens, we're going to get a real image. So plus lenses tend to give you a real image behind the lens. Whereas this minus lens, um, are going to actually bend the light behind the lens. You can picture the light coming in from the left in all these pictures. So you're going to get a line, a focal line behind the lens. And in this case, you'd get a virtual image of the line. So a little bit about power cross. Because a power cross is just a way that you can represent um, a glasses prescription, a contact lens prescription. Um, so it can make sense in a picture to you to see exactly where the power um, is in each meridian. So this is the prescription that Joe has been given for his glasses. So how would we represent this on this power cross here? So we're going to have one power along this vertical meridian, one power across this horizontal meridian. Um, so does anybody want to have a shot at what would go with where? Aside from Ryan back there. Okay. 
This is actually super helpful, especially when you're in Hoffman's clinic and doing retinoscopy. So does the plus three go on the horizontal one? Great, great thought there. So, <laughs> so actually, so, so the way to do it is um, this first number here, so your spherical power, always goes on the axis that is listed here. So you just put that minus two right here. Let's see. I don't, oh, wait a minute. Axis 90. Sorry. The, yes, I totally just, it's early in the morning. Sorry. The minus two is at axis 90. So it is this number, but that's not the horizontal. That's right here. Okay, thank you. So we put the minus two up here at axis 90. So now the question is, does the minus three go here or what number goes here? So it's actually, or the, the, not the, not the, the minus, the plus three. So you actually add these two together in order to get the number that goes on your opposite meridian. So we're going to have a plus one there. That was all very confusing. I'm sorry. I confused it. So you have this power. So you put the minus two at axis 90, and then you add these two together to figure out what your 90 degree power is from. It will be along the horizontal. Um, so what does that look like inside the eye? Um, so this is their ocular correction. So we know that one of these is going to produce a horizontal line, one of these is going to produce a vertical line. And it's actually the opposite of what is in the power of the lens. Um, because of the representation of what we had here, um, to show you here. So the vertical line, a minus two, is actually going to produce a horizontal line in front of the retina. And the plus one will produce a vertical. I know I have these labeled as H and V. That's just saying which power they're coming from on the power cross. So this vertical line here, the minus two, will produce an image in front of the retina. That's a horizontal line. The horizontal plus one will produce a vertical image behind the retina. A little confusing there because it seems backwards, but that's exactly what the lenses end up doing. OK, so here's one of our practice quiz questions to work on. Um, so a point source for infinity sight strikes a cylinder lens with a power with this power, and it's in minus cylinder form here. I know I apologize. Um, at what distance and orientation will the images be from the lens? So start out by doing a power cross based on what we learned on the last one. And then this is just the lens. We're not necessarily worried about the eye here. We're just wondering at what distance from the lens will these images so since be produced? This is minus here, do you have to change the way you power cross? Is it still the same? It's actually the same, yeah. Um, but you, when you add the powers together, that will be the one difference. And we'll talk about switching from minus cell to plus cell as well. Does anybody want to venture a guess on well, either I'll one of the guess. powers? Okay. Is that like the. Um, So here's our power cross. Vertical. Five. Oh, nope. <laughs> I know, it's, it's backwards. It seems totally backwards. Um, yeah, so we have a plus two and a plus four. So we have to convert that into a distance. So we're going to have one over four, which is 25 centimeters. 0.25 meters, but because this is along the horizontal axis, the image it produces is actually a vertical image, it throws at 90 degrees. <clears throat> we'll also have, um, because of this plus two here, we'll have one over two or 50 centimeters, and this is going to be, since it's a vertical um, reading here, are we going to have a horizontal line or a vertical line? Horizontal. 
So we'll have a horizontal line, 50 centimeters. Now I love this representation because this, this shows why we actually prescribe cylinder for patients because is it really that useful to have an, a vertical image or a horizontal image for the patient? Um, if the prescription's off one way or another, that's, what they, that's exactly what they'd see on their retina. But when we get the focal point, when we move the prescription so it's exactly between those two cylinder powers, you can see how the image actually kind of takes shape. And so that right in between the two, um, it's actually like a point focus, which is what we have with spherical lenses, somebody who doesn't have astigmatism. So that's the, that's the point where we would want to put the retina, is right where the, there's that point, the focal point there. But this represents what the image is actually doing between these two line focal points. Okay, so this one's already got a little bit of the work done for you here. Um, so now we put a point, so, so, so before we had an image coming from infinity basically hitting that lens. Now we're actually having a point of light 33 centimeters in front of the lens. So now we, we add a little bit of extra math here. So you might actually have to write a couple things down. Um, so what is that gonna do to, where, where's that gonna put our, our images at this point? So you have our same power cross. So if life was coming from infinity, it'd be the exact same as it was before, but now we have to, we have to think of, we've shifted where the object distance is coming from now. So it's just like a minus three? A minus three, exactly. So you, which is how we end up here. So one over 0 0.33, you're gonna get a minus three. It's because it's coming from the left. So you just add that to our power cross, basically, which gets us the minus one and the plus you, one. You just add that to each axis? Mm -hmm. Yep, each axis. So knowing that, knowing that we have a minus one and a plus one, at different axes now. Where's that gonna put our images? How about for the minus one? So what's an image distance for a minus one diopter? It's like um, to the left of the lens. Uh-huh, the left. It's a virtual. Mm -hmm. So it'll be one meter. Yeah. And do you think that would be a horizontal line or a vertical line? Uh, oh, okay, so I did. I ended up doing the, the plus one first. But so this one would be. Okay, I keep pushing on button. So from this horizontal one, that's the one that it just turned out with the first here. Um, it's going to be a vertical line. Yeah, about 100 centimeters, one meter be, behind. So that'll be a real image. And the other case, we have a horizontal line. 100 centimeters behind. So let's talk a little about spherical equivalent. There's just a basic formula for that. If you get a prescription, and spherical equivalent comes in handy a lot of times, especially in contact lenses, um, when you rotate through with Dr. Meyer and myself. Um, but the basic formula is sphere plus half the sill. And the sign does matter when we're talking about the cylinder. So in this case, we have a plus sill prescription here, refraction. So what would our spherical equivalent be in this case? Uh, minus a half. So you have minus two plus 150 minus a half, exactly. So pretty easy, but when you get into the higher sills, you, know, you might actually have to pull out a calculator sometimes. So this is um, kind of one of the examples coming from the book here. So um, with a couple extra steps mixed in. So first, how would you place this on a power cross? So we have a different axis besides 90 and, and 180 here. So, we're, so it's axis 120. So how would we actually draw that power cross? Does somebody want to shout out, what would be at axis 120? Mm -hmm. And then what's our other axis going to be? 90 degrees away. 30. Mm -hmm. uh, plus 
minus four, plus one, exactly. So next question, what is the spherical equivalent in this case? Yeah, awesome. Exactly, so it's just the sphere, this first number, plus half of this, so minus one fifty. <clears throat> so now how do we convert this to minus so does anybody know off the top of it so Eileen so you like add the minus four and the plus five and that's your new sphere mm -hmm. um, so that'd be a plus one and then the plus five you just turn that into the minus five and then you just do 90 degrees from the 120 so it'd be 30 so. exactly perfect so I have kind of outlined the steps here but sometimes from us dumb optometrists you'll get these minus sill prescriptions. Actually, we, I completely learned in minus sill, so I had to totally shift things when I got here. Um, but even, even the four options are weird. But um, anyway, so yeah, that's exactly right. So if you get a prescription, somebody comes and they have their prescription from their optometrist, I mean, no, normally your text will be you know, kind of converting that for you. But it's important to know, like to be able to convert in your mind, okay, this is, you know, plus five, and I want to do contact lenses, I need to go into minus sill. How do I do that? Or I have this minus sill prescription, I need to convert it so that I can know what their prescriptions have been for the last several years to know if I can do LASIK on them, whatever the case may be. So here's the steps. The first number is just the sphere plus the sill. Sign does matter, once again. Change the sign of the sill. That's all you have to do with the middle number and then change the axis by 90 degrees, so exactly. Um, plus one minus five, axis 30. So these are, there's, there's actually another way to write cylinder that um, is almost never used. Ryan, have you ever even seen this used anywhere? So I don't know, maybe it is, is it? Use it like in one of the OCAP review books. Yeah. So it's important to at least learn about, but I'm, in practice, I've never ever seen it used. Um, so these are all the same prescription. So a minus two at axis 180, um, and then a plus one at axis 90. So if you did a power cross for this prescription up here, what would be at axis 90? Minus two, and what would be at axis 180? Plus one. So, you, so the way you would actually draw this in a power cross, it's weird, but you actually put the minus two at axis 90 and the plus one at axis 180. Yeah, um, I don't know what the practical application of that is, but if it's an O caps. Well, they, like it's in the uh, last minute optics book that we use. Is it? It is. Yeah. It's on his lecture. Too. So, is it? So, I'm sure it has some practical application. I'm not sure what it is, but it's on there for you. So, um, okay, so just a little bit about the different types of astigmatism with the rule, against the rule, and oblique. So, with the rule, <coughs> the vertical meridi meridian is steepest. So, in plus sill, that's axis 90, and minus sill, that's axis 180. And this just shows. Um, plus sill between, so anything between 60 and 120 degrees would be considered with the rule, like with the rule coordinate. Against the rule, anything between 30 and 150 would be considered against the rule. And that just means the horizontal meridian of the cornea is steepest. And then oblique would just be whatever's left. So between 31 to 59 and 121 to 149 would be oblique. When it comes to contact lenses, I know Dr. Meyer would talk a lot about more with contact lenses. Most brands tend to get a little skimpy on the oblique meridians just because they're not as common. But you can, you, between, you know, on, on these more with the rule and against the rules, you can pretty much find every 10 degrees in, in, those, in those ones with almost every brand. It does a stigma to <clears throat> Excuse me. So, 
Here's the different classifications for if you wanted to be really specific about what kind of refractive error a patient had. You'd give them one of these classifications. A simple myope, simple hypero, and then on down the line. Can so does it yes. Can I ask why it matters? Maybe you're gonna talk about why it matters. Um <clears throat> it probably isn't used that often, but it, it can be helpful so that you if I if I told um told you that there's a sim this patient had simple myopic astigmatism, you'd be able to know at least what one of the meridians of that prescription is without knowing anything else about the patient. If you know that they're a simple myope, you'd know that they had no astigmatism, but that they were just myopic. So, I mean, numbers-wise, it doesn't help too much because you still don't know what their actual prescription is, but um, I, I, I honestly, when, when ICD-10 was coming out, I thought that we'd have to be this specific, and I'm glad that we don't. Um, but, but you can, by, by, knowing, by seeing one of, one of these names, you can know exactly where the astigmatism is and where it's doing, at least on which side of the retina the images are. So if I said this patient is a simple myope, where would, like, what does that mean? Anybody know? Yeah. And is there one image? Is there two images? Yeah, exactly. So there, there's no cylinder in that prescription. They're like a minus three myope, so it's going to be the images focused in front of the retina. Simple hyperope would be a plus three behind the retina. What about simple myopic or simple hyperopic astigmatism? I'll, sh I'll show pictures of these in just a second. I think that means like the vertical and the horizontal line images are both like my, you know, in myope, they're both in front of the retina. Or Actually, so that's no. that's compound. Oh, no. So so simple. So it's important to know, so you can just know her. Um, so simple would be that, <laughs> that uh, so simple myopic astigmatism means that one of the meridians is actually on the retina. So one of those would be like, it'd be like a Plano minus three. Um, simple hyperopic means one of the meridians is on the retina, the other one's behind the retina. Compound means they're both one direction. So both images are in front of or behind the retina. And then mixed astigmatism is where you have one in front of the retina, one behind. So we'll do some picture representations of that. But that's one reason why it's helpful. It's like if I know this person has mixed astigmatism, that means that you know one of the images is in front of or behind the retina. Because it's just good to know. Um, so this top one here, how would we categorize this? We have a single image behind the retina. Exactly. Simple hyper. Um, what about this one here? We have one image on the retina, one image in front of it. And is it simple? Comp okay, simple, exactly. So simple, one of the images on the retina, so it's simple. It kind of throws me off that the, they use the word simple here. I kind of wish they wouldn't have, but, um, but yeah. So this is simple myopic astigmatism. Now one more um, thing to add to the mix here. So just to re review quickly, so with the rule, the vertical meridian is of the cornea is steepest. So think about what kind of image that would produce. And looking back, again, once at this simple myopic astigmatism, so we end up having a vertical line in front of the retina, horizontal line on the retina. So is this with the rule or against the rule? The line. So what kind of... Yeah. So why would it be against the rule? So the cylinder is, is it, so it's giving some horizontal line. Mm-hmm. So more power is steeper. Yeah, so if, if the horizontal part of the, the cornea is steeper, that means the image that's in front of the retina is going to be vertical. So the H and the V, once again, just remember, that's just telling you where the line is coming from on the cornea. But yeah, in this case, it's against the rule. Ah, crap. Um, so what's this one, guys? So, so we have both images behind the retina. So I already gave it up. Compound hyperopic astigmatism. And is this one against the rule or with the rule? No. The image in front. So the first image comes from the vertical, so that means the vertical part of the cornea is steeper. 
I mean, it's with the rule. And then this last one. That's mixed uh, in the against the rule. Nailed it, yeah. So mixed, we have one image in front of and behind the retina. Um, and really, in this case, you know how I talked about how the lines come to a point focus? So it's kind of right in the, the, the retina falls kind of right in between these two images. So they, this person who corrected would likely actually still be seen like, pretty well um, because the point focus would be, would be coming right on them, or even uncorrected. Um, they'd still be seen at least decently well. OK. Um, this is something I'm not going to spend too much time on, but basically it just says if you, you can induce astigmatism like in a, pair, in a patient's glasses by tilting their lenses. We kind of do this on, on purpose, um, but not to induce astigmatism, but, but they're, they're, most patients' pair of glasses is actually tilted a little bit. But if you tilted a plus lens, um, well, so if you tilt a plus lens along the horizontal axis, um, so like a, it'll, it'll be axis 180, and you'll actually induce plus cylinder if it's a plus lens or a minus cylinder if it's a minus lens. So not too important, except that if, if a patient's glasses are too tilted, and they just have a spherical prescription, and they're, they're saying things are blurry, it might just be that there's this induced astigmatism from the corrective lenses. You don't have to like go into like detail with all the formulas. There are certain formulas that we had to do tests on and stuff, but um, also pump and patch there. Okay, so, so combining cylinders. So what if you have two cylindrical lenses or like two lenses that you take out of the drawer and you need to actually combine them to produce a certain type of correction. We're not going to do that too often, but but if you did, if we did have combined cylinders here, how would we do it? <clears throat> so first we have minus one axis ninety and plus one axis one eighty. So in this case, since it's axis one eighty, the plus one, it's just like this is saying Plano plus one axis one eighty. So plane would go along the 180, and the plus 1 ends up on that 90 degree axis. The same over here. So it's minus 1 axis 90, so the minus 1 will actually go along the horizontal. So we've combined these two cylinders together. We pulled these two cylinders, a plus 1 and a minus 1 sill lens, put them 90 degrees apart. So the question is, you know, is the, is the entire power of this lens system now like how do we how do we know what the power of that lens system is? If we if we point it to a, a degree axis, say forty five degrees, what is the power going to be at that point? So any guesses on what the power would be at axis forty five? What do you think? Right. Me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is actually. So you basically just. Um, add these two together if it's 45 degrees apart from where the two axes are. So because it's halfway between a plus one and a minus one, adding those together, we end up with plano. So what if it's, uh, say, along 30 degrees or 60 degrees? Um, any ideas what it might be? So it's a little bit closer to the minus one. Does anybody have an idea of what the power might be at 30 degrees or how we would even calculate that? So it's a third of the way between Plano and minus one is kind of a way to think of it. So we're gonna end up with about minus 0.37. Same with up here at axis 60, it's a third of the way between Plano and plus one. It's actually a plus 0.37. So it's a little confusing, but it's more, I think it works better just to think of it in a picture form than to try to think too deeply into it. It's just, 
it's a third of the way between Plano and minus 1. A third of that is minus 0.27. Um, so here we have um, two different cylinder lenses. <coughs> so Plano plus 1 axis 30 and Plano plus 1 axis 150. So we're wondering what is if we needed to combine these and we wanted to know we wanted like an axis 180 and an axis 90 here. So in this case, um, with this lens by itself, along the horizontal, it's about two-thirds away from the plus one, if that makes sense, when we have an axis 30. So it's like 30 degrees away from plus one. Or, sorry, 60 degrees away from plus one. 30 degrees away from Plano. So we're going to end up with a plus 3.33 in this one. Along the vertical meridian, what would it be there? Any ideas? So it's like 30. It's basically just 1 minus the 0.33. So about 0.66. Now we're on this one, we just tilted the axis a little bit. But we'll end up with basically the same results here. So plus 0.33 at 180, plus 0.66. So now we, now we want to know um, in this lens system, how much to if we combine these lenses, how much total power would we have at axis 180, and how much total power would we have at axis 90. So, any ideas on how we would do that? Just add them. Yeah. Exactly. You just add them together. That's exactly right. Um, so we're going to end up with plus 0.67 at 180 and 1.32 at axis or at 90. So we've combined those two cylinders, and we want to know how would we actually write that prescription in plus sil form. So. I'm actually hoping one of you guys can do this. But one important thing to note here is that we're saying it's point, plus 0.67 at 180, which is different than axis. It goes on the horizontal. So maybe try to do, try to put this on a power cross real quick and then give me a plus sil Rx for this. And it's not a nice round number, I apologize for that. but. an answer, you can just throw it out there. Yeah, yeah, basically exactly. So you put it on a power cross, this is what you end up with. In plus still form, you always put the the least plus number first, 0.67. Um, and then you take the difference between those two, which is about 0.67. And then since the lower number is first, that's what our axis is. Really good job. OK, so the reason that we've been talking about these power crosses and things is the um, retinoscopy is a big part of that. Um, so here's like a, a story, potential story problem you might get, or you might actually find in clinic. So you're retinoscoping an aphakic Down syndrome patient. The streak orient, oriented horizontally, you get a neutral reflex at plus 22. With the streak oriented vertically, you get a neutral reflex with a plus 27. So first, just if you just take those two powers that I gave you, ignore working distance and all that, how would you do a power cross for that? 
what number would be on the horizontal, what number would be on the vertical? Plus 22 would be on the horizontal. Or no, it would be where the power across would be. Oh, yeah? Maybe the power cross is just adding too much confusion. It's super helpful for, for me, though, sometimes. So just remember, the streak, the streak is oriented horizontally. So what are you actually, you're moving that streak up and down to see what this axis is here. So our plus 22 is actually going to be along the vertical because you're moving the streak up and down. Our plus 27 is going to be along the horizontal. So now a working distance of 50 centimeters. So how much do we actually need to, what do we need to do to the prescription because of our working distance? Subtract, you subtract minus 2. Mm -hmm. Yep, 1 over 0.5 is going to be 2. <clears throat> so we just take minus 2 from both of those. So that's going to give us a plus 20 and a plus 25. So what is our prescription now? Plus 20 plus 5, I think. Yeah, awesome. So I think this is like an awesome potential problem you can get. Um, and you'll run into this all the time in Pete's clinic. And if you need to ret somebody in clinic, which we do all the time in contacts. Um, so now we'll kind of burn through a lot of stuff pretty quick. So um, spherical aberrations, this just means that the farther you get away from the center of the lens, um, it actually, the lens actually bends the light rays a little bit more. So instead of getting a nice crisp image um, in a plus lens, it actually bends the light a little bit more out towards the edge. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually focused a little bit more anteriorly. So why does this matter? Um, so image quality can, can decrease with a larger pupil is basically what it comes down to. Um, and this has a, this can be a big issue with like night myopia. I don't know if you have patients who complain that their vision gets worse at night, I mean, certainly with cataracts and things like that. Um, but when you, get a, when you have a bigger pupil, um, the light can, it, it just makes a bigger difference be, because some of the light is now being able to be, um, well, it will be focused more anteriorly to the retina and cause just a bigger blur circle for the patient. So the variable in all this is just the pupil size. If you have a smaller pupil, it won't matter as much if, if there's spherical aberrations in the answer. Well, what happens when uh, people have that problem and like, they, you have them put on like, a minus one to drive or something like that, would that help at all? Has anyone ever looked at that? Yeah. Yeah, it can. So sometimes, so actually this, this happens like all the time. Somebody will have like a, a low prescription, like, I mean, it's like minus 50 plus a quarter or something like that. They get along just fine, but their complaint is my, my vision at night when I'm driving sucks. I get so much glare and everything. So that's a prime opportunity to give them that prescription just for like a pair of night driving glasses, because that's going to help that light be focused in the, with the bigger pupil. Um, and this also comes into play with the... With, uh, refractive surgery. So because normally the cornea is flatter in the periphery, the, the, the body actually handles this by making the, the cornea flatter in the periphery. So it does, it's not as noticeable. But then we go ahead and flatten out the middle of the cornea and it kind of takes away some of that. So that's why pupil size is such a big deal when it comes to refractive surgery and making sure that they take that into account. Because otherwise, if they have a larger pupil, at the end of the day, at night, they're gonna get a whole lot of glare and halos. And it just has to do with where that light's being refracted to. And just to show how much of an effect it has, doubling the pupil size increases the spherical aberrations by about 16 times. So it's the fourth power. And there's also chromatic aberrations. That just means that um, light, um, it, based on wavelength, um, is, is bent e either faster or slower. So, so the difference between like, Blue light hitting the eye and red light is actually about a half diopter, which is quite a bit. This is just a representation of where light, different colored lights might actually, you know, the same
power hitting the eye might actually be, end up being refracted. And we can use this in a couple different tests, but um, this is by sh showing that by using different lenses, we can shift where the colors are actually visible on the eye. OK, so another important concept I want to get to is just this near point and far point. So it, it's kind of it's a pretty simple concept. When we throw an accommodation, then that's where it kind of can get confusing. So the far point is basically what's the farthest point away from their eye that they can see. For a Mayo, is that image going to be in front of the eye or behind the eye? Their far point. Uncorrected, we're talking about here. So they're myopic. The light obviously is showing up in in front of their retina. But is there, like, at what point can myopes see a clear image? Yeah, it's up close, right? But it's still in front of their eye. Hyperopes, on the other hand, if they have zero accommodation. They're kind of screwed because it's behind their eye. So they can never see clearly if they have no accommodation and they're uncorrected. So, um, so we'll, ju this, we'll just with a couple diagrams, we'll just demonstrate some of these. So the far point is the, f the farthest point away from the eye that they can see clearly without correction. The near point is when, we, when they accommodate what's the closest that they can see. So. The farthest away the eye can see clearly with accommodation entirely at rest is the far point. Or an object point imaged by the eye onto the retina in an unaccommodated eye. Um, so why is this important? So if we know that they're a minus 3 myo, and so their far point is 33 centimeters away from the eye, we want to give them a pair of glasses that's going to put the image right where their far point is. So minus 3 lens. We'll put the image at 33 centimeters and make it seem like they're looking at, at optical infinity, even though their eye's still looking at this point. But the lens has put the image there for them, and so they can actually see clearly far away. So we want to put the correcting lens, have it image be at the eye's far point. That's what we want to do. Um, so in myopia, here's just the, the little demonstration here. So light coming from infinity in an uncorrected state ends up being in front of their retina. So their far point is maybe just a little bit in front. But we put a lens there that has its secondary focal point right at where the, the patient's far point is, and it puts that image right on the retina. Um, so the accommodative amplitude is basically how much the patient is able to accommodate. We know that at age 40, it starts to decrease. Really, it's been decreasing a little bit throughout almost their whole lives. But at age 40 is when it, it really starts to present itself. So in an uncorrected myope, their far point um, will be in front of their near point. But there's still a pretty limited range, depending on what their prescription is, of clear vision. So the image that, that they can see clearly on their retina is the far point. With accommodation, they can actually focus in to see where this near point is. And then this distance here is their accommodative ampl amplitude. And the distance you can convert it into diopters. But they're both in front of the eye. So here's an uncorrected hyperope. So they're far point is actually behind the eye, which sucks because that'll be really blurry. And if they can't accommodate to get a near point, then they can never see clearly. But their near point, through accommodation, can still be in front of their eye. It basically just shifts the image forward. But if, if they can't accommodate enough, then both the far point and the near point might actually be behind the eye. But in a young patient, typically they can still see clearly um, at, at distance by accommodation. Mm-hmm. So this green line here is just showing, so the image that's actually showing up on the retina 
is coming from a point source, say 33 centimeters away. But then they can accommodate a little bit closer. Oh. So here's a little story problem here. So Paul, Paul's far point is 12.5 centimeters behind his cornea. So that's going to be a hyperopic prescription. Um, how much is it? So we just do 1 over 0.125. It's a plus 8 hypero. His accommodative amplitude is 5 diopters. So what would his near point be? So with accommodative amplitude, it literally is just like addition and subtraction. So he's a plus 8 hypero. He can accommodate 5 diopters. So 8 minus 5. He'd still have 3 diopters remaining hyperopia yeah, there. Which is bad news because that means that his, his near point is actually behind the retina as well. Because it's still a plus three. So there's like no area of clear vision for this patient in an uncorrected state. Everything's blurry. So the near point's 33 centimeters to the retina. Okay, so I'll let you just do this one real quick and then we're almost done here. Um, so Larry is an uncorrected myope with a far point of 40 centimeters. What is his refractive error? So suppose he looks at a book 25 centimeters in front of his eyes. How much accommodation would he need to see it clearly? This gets a little bit tricky. So how do we even set this up? So you do one over 25. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So his, the amount of the power that he needs is a minus four because he's trying to look at something 25 centimeters away. Exactly. So if his natural refractive error is a minus 2.5 and he needs to get to minus four, how much accommodation would be required? Exactly. Yeah. So when you're accommodating, you're adding minus power. It's bringing it closer. So it's always going to be a minus number unless you're relaxing the combination. Exactly. You did exactly right. So we're going to do 1 over quarter. That's 4 diopters required. He already has 2.5, so 4 minus 2.5 is 1.5 diopters. So what if it's 10 centimeters in front of his eyes? What would just be like the required? Yeah, so 7.5. So hopefully he has that much if he needs to look that close. So, so, so his refractive error is minus 2.5. It's just another way of asking a question. So if, his, if the maximum amount he could accommodate, the amplitude of computation is 9 diopters, where would his near point be? So in diopters, before we even figure out like the distance, what's the total power that he could produce with his eyes? So it's a minus 250. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll, no, it's actually, I mean, it should be, it's two and a half, it's plus two and a half diopters of myopia, so it's still a minus 2.5. So 11 and a half diopters. That's going to be about 8.7 centimeters. So that's a close, so, so he's going to be between 40 centimeters and 8.7 centimeters. That's the only area that he has clear vision when he's correct. Everything else is perfect. <clears throat> um, so 48 year old, so now we're dealing with <clears throat> presbyopia here. So Maureen is 48, four diopter myo. Um, she's wearing bifocals with a plus two ad. And she has one diopter of remaining accommodation. So what is the far point of her natural eye? So plus four. Where's that going to put the far point? So you do minus four my So you do point two five centimeters. Mm-hmm. 
And is it in front of the eye or behind the eye? Yeah. So it should be like a minus 0.25 to the right. B to the left, yeah. Oh, crap. And then what's the near point without her glasses? Um, five diopters, so one over five point two meters. So her clear vision range is from 0.25 to 0.2 meters. It's like five centimeters of clear vision when she's uncorrected. What is the range of vision with her glasses on though? So she goes from five centimeters to, so, what, so with her glasses on, so she's fully corrected now, so what's her far point now? Infinity. Yeah, when she's corrected, she can actually see all the way to infinity, theoretically, without cataracts and all that. Um, and then she, so she has a plus two add now, plus an additional diopter of accommodation. So you have about three diopters total that she can get up close. So three diopters in front of the eye. So what distance is that? Yeah, 0.33, exactly. So she basically now, with her glasses on, she goes from five centimeters to infinity all the way to 33 centimeters. And that just kind of shows how we got there. But so big difference by that patient being correct. So this just shows like different types of bifocals. So she could still take her glasses off, and, and oftentimes they do. You know, like those myopic patients will just take their glasses off to read if they're, if they're within that range of vision. But with her, with her amount of accommodation and, and her bifocal, she could get about, yeah, so you like the minus eight or something? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so with bifocals, um, I just wanted to show this because Part of the lecture in the next one minute is about prism. With bifocals, it's important because if they have a line there, because there's different prescriptions here, there's a little bit of image jump that happens. And that's important for patients when they're first learning bifocals. When you prescribe them their first pair of bifocals and they're like, I don't want to pay for a PAO, I'm just going to get the line. It can be good to educate them that, hey, be careful around steps and curves because when the bottom part of your lens, there's a little bit of an image jump there. So just when you're walk, walking on the street, look down to go up your curves. Um, and you can calculate, there's formulas to calculate exactly how much image jump there is. That's not really important for this lecture. But um, by going from one prescription to immediately jumping into the next, um, and, the, and, it, and it can vary depending on if there's a plus lens or minus lens as well, as far as the magnitude. So I'm going to skip through. This just shows like round top. We'll um, yeah. So there are a couple other things if we had time that I was going to talk about. But um, so um, hopefully that helps a little bit to know how to convert from plus sill to minus sill, how to work with accommodation to figure out what are these people actually seeing clearly without glasses. I and mean, most of the time we're just going to prescribe them glasses anyway. But if somebody calls and they've lost their glasses, it can wow, you know, they're plus six hyper open, they're, they're 60, they can't see clearly anywhere right now. So, um, and um, so I know we're, it's, it's about 7.57 right now, so we gotta get up to clinic, but any questions about any of this? I, there's a lot of stuff to talk about, optics related, not most of the most exciting, but if you have any questions about it, email me or um, seriously, I really have to help you. Because a lot of that optic stuff is really fun and don't doesn't get used that much in clinic, but it's it's good important. So. Thank you.